Hello and welcome back humans. I'm Jason and today we're going to dive into a question that's been bubbling up in curiosity circles for a while. Can Coca-Cola or other soda actually burn a hole in your stomach? After all, cola contains acid, right? So can it actually do damage to your insides? And we're gonna tackle all of this from a chemistry and physics point of view. So we've all heard the wild urban legends about this famous fizzy drink, Coca-Cola, other cola drinks, but let's get to the bottom of it with some science. Grab a seat, maybe a cold drink, just not too close to your stomach, and let's get started. All right, let's just jump right in. There's one popular myth out there that suggests that drinking Coca-Cola can actually cause some serious damage to your insides, like burning a hole in your stomach. Another version of the tale warns of carbon dioxide poisoning or even dissolving your teeth. Today, we're focusing on the first claim. So can Coke really burn through your stomach lining? Well, the short answer is no, but to understand why, we need to dive a little bit deeper into chemistry and physiology. So the idea that Coke can actually burn a hole in the inside of your stomach likely comes from its acidic nature. To understand this, we have to talk a little bit about some chemistry and physics, specifically acids and bases, and what we call the pH scale. The pH scale measures how acidic or basic a substance is, and it ranges from zero to 14. A pH of seven is absolutely neutral, and anything below seven is considered acidic, and anything above seven is considered basic. So seven is right in the middle, and the farther away you get for seven, from seven, the more and more and more acidic you go as you get closer to zero. But I wanna make sure you understand, technically it is possible to have a pH below zero, that would be a negative pH, and that would just be a really, really, really strong acid. That's something we don't normally come in everyday contact with, right? But from seven being neutral and going down closer to zero is more and more and more acidic. When you go above seven, closer and closer and closer to 14, that's getting more and more basic, which is the opposite of an acid is a base, all right? So I remember when I first learned this the first time, I was very confused. Why does it have a middle at seven? And why is getting closer to zero more acidic? It, it, seemed, it seemed like a weird scale. The details of how the pH scale is designed, it just comes into the how it's defined and calculated, which I'm gonna get into a little bit more uh, in just a minute. We're not gonna put the equation down, but I'll definitely get the main concept to you. So to drive it all home, Coca-Cola has a pH of about 2.5, which is actually fairly acidic, right? Now this acidity mainly comes from phosphoric acid, which is a key ingredient of Coke. Now you might be thinking, if Coke is so acidic, shouldn't it be harmful? Well, actually, in common language, we say that acid burns you. And I put the burning in quotation because we all know that it's not like burning, like burning a piece of paper. What kind of burning does an acid actually do? And do acid burns have anything to do with regular burns that you get from like a hot stove or a candle flame? To answer that, let's take a closer look at the insides of our stomachs. So our stomach is actually incredibly resilient and designed to handle acidic environments. The stomach contains hydrochloric acid, which is even more potent than the phosphoric acid that's in Coke. The pH of stomach acid is right around one. It could be a little bit less, a little bit more, but that's a good average value. And this makes it one of the strongest acids in common everyday experience. This acid helps break down food and kill harmful bacteria. Now, there's a couple of things I really wanna emphasize here. pH, what does that mean? pH actually stands for the power of hydrogen. That's something that would be good for you to remember because when you get into chemistry, you're gonna learn that pH is really measuring hydrogen ions that are in solution. I'm gonna talk a whole lot more about that in just a second. Before we get there, let's talk about the pH scale itself, the power of hydrogen scale. We said it goes from zero to 14, where seven is neutral in the middle. The number one thing I really want you to understand about the pH scale is that it is a logarithmic scale. Logarithms, it's something we learn in algebra and a lot of people forget it, they don't care about it, they never understand it other than it's just a button on the calculator. I wanna to explain to you what a log scale means. What a log scale means is it behaves just like the Richter scale for earthquakes that you might have some experience with. 
logarithmic means that every tick mark that you go on that scale is not a value of one, it's a jump of tenfold, right? So what it means is if you go from a, you know, a Richter scale of one to two or a pH value of one to two, that is not a, a difference in one, because you would think one to two is just one. Every tick mark is tenfold. So it looks like a difference in pH of one, like going from one to two or something like this, is, is just a one, but it's actually 10 times more concentrated acid. Think of it that way. And so, for instance, going from one to two on the pH scale is a tenfold potency of acid, power of hydrogen, okay? Going from five to six, for instance, again, that's a difference of one, but it's a logarithmic, so it's really tenfold difference, okay? And if you go, for instance, from one to three, that's not a difference of two because it's a tenfold each time. Tenfold for the first tick mark and tenfold for the next tenfold uh, tick mark. So 10 times 10 is 100. So if you jump from one to three, that's a difference in 100 times on the scale, right? And if you go from like one to four, that's a difference of, of three tick marks, but that's a thousand. So it's 10 to the power of whatever it is, uh, whatever difference you have. So every tick mark is 10. And so it, it doesn't look like, oh, a pH of one versus a pH of four, that's not that big of a deal. But that's like a huge difference because this is a logarithmic scale. And that's why earthquakes behave the same way. You know, you might see an earthquake of five and say, ooh, that was, a, that was a pretty big earthquake. And then somebody else has an earthquake of six and you're thinking, well, that's not much more. Well, actually five to six is 10 times more. 10 times more energy. So that's a huge difference. And if you go from like five to seven on the Richter scale, that's a hundred times of the energy. So, so those scales are compressed like that because of the way the calculation works with, with acids and the concentration of ions. Basically, you use a logarithmic scale when the range of values you have is so enormous that you wouldn't be able to fit the scale on a, on a piece of paper. It wouldn't make sense. So instead of saying every tick mark is one, you just say every tick mark is 10, and that allows you to compress the scale and make it usable for humans. Now, I want you to remember that the closer we get to zero, the stronger the acid is. Right, so if Coke has a pH of 2.5, roughly, which is over here, let's say, and then uh, you know hydrochloric acid in our gastric uh, juices in there in our stomach is about a one, all right? So that's a difference of about 1.5. So if it was a difference of one, that would be 10 times stronger acid would be your stomach acid, but it's even more than that. So it's more than a factor of 10. You can calculate the exact amount if you got a calculator out, but just suffice it to say the difference in potency, the power of hydrogen of those two acids is more than 10 times. Stomach acid is more than 10 times stronger or concentrated than the acid that's in Coke. So our stomach lining is equipped to deal with all of these harsh conditions. Specifically, it's equipped to deal with acid. It secretes a thick layer of mucus on the inside of your stomach, and that protects the lining from the corrosive effects of hydrochloric acid. So compared to the acid that's already inside of you in the stomach, the phosphoric acid in Coke or other sodas is relatively mild. Now, before we move on, I want to talk for a bit about what actually is an acid anyway. Why do we say acids burn? Why do we use that word? How can acids burn anything or corrode through anything? For instance, maybe you've seen the movie Alien out there, right? The, the alien has blood inside of it that's got an acid in it. And if you stab the alien or blow the head off the alien or whatever, the blood comes out, but it's an acid, right? So, and it's a really, really potent acid and it dissolves through the decking of the ship, you know, maybe three, four, five, six levels, right? And real acids do behave like that, of course, not that potent, but they do basically dissolve metals like this. So what does that mean? Why do acids do what they do? Is it some sort of like magic substance or what is the chemistry? Why do they do that? That's what I wanna to get to next. So in simplest terms, an acid is a substance so that when you dissolve it in water, that substance donates what we call a hydrogen ion into the solution. If you think about um, you know, a glass of water and you pour salt in it, okay? That's sodium chloride. There's one atom of sodium bonded to one atom of chlorine in the crystal of salt or whatever, you know, salt crystal or, you know, the teaspoon of salt or whatever you pour in there. As soon as you put it in the water, the water is able to dissolve and separate the sodium and the chlorine into ions. And when it's dissolved in the water, the sodium as a charged ion is floating around, a positive ion. And the chlorine is a negative ion that's also floating around. 
and they're not really able to recombine back into a crystal of sodium chloride because the water molecules are also charged. We call it polar, uh, and they're able to keep them separated, keep them from recombining. That's what we call dissociating uh, into, uh, into, into a water like this. So, so dissolving is when it breaks down, dissociating is when it separates into ions. But an acid is a substance, when you put it in the water, it actually dissociates so that there's a hydrogen ion as one of the uh, species present in the water. That's really the definition. It's called a hydrogen ion donor, or you might think of it as just a proton donor. If you remember, hydrogen is element number one on the periodic table. And that means it's the simplest element. And so hydrogen only has a single proton in the nucleus. There's no neutrons, or at least for the simplest form of hydrogen, there's no neutrons there. And it's just a, a proton in the nucleus and a single electron. So if it were to do, uh, donate a hydrogen ion, what does that mean? A hydrogen ion would be a hydrogen atom where we take one of the electrons away. And so what's left over? Just the proton. So you can use the word hydrogen ion to be synonymous with proton. That's what it is. A proton just by itself is exactly the same thing as a hydrogen ion. So what we say is acids are what we call proton donors. It's just like when you dump the salt in the water and they separate into sodium and chlorine ions. If you dump an acid, some powdery acid into, into solution there, and then it would dissociate into hydrogen ions and something else. So let's talk about the most common acid that you probably heard of, our stomach acid. That's the hydrochloric acid. Remember I said sodium chloride, that was salt. Hydrochloric acid is hydrogen bonded to chlorine, just like salt is very similar. It's sodium bonded to chlorine, right? So hydrochloric acid and sodium chloride are pretty similar. If both contain chlorine, you just take out the sodium and replace it with hydrogen. When you dump that into water, what happens? It breaks apart just like the sodium chloride does, but you have the chlorine ion floating around just like salt, but instead of sodium ion, you have these hydrogen ions floating in solution. And that's just called protons. So we say that, a, uh, uh, that an acid is a substance that donates a proton. And the more protons you have in solution, the stronger the acid. Right? Let me say that again. The more protons, or in chemistry we say, the higher concentration of protons that you have in that solution, then the stronger the acid. Think of it as salt water. If you put a little bit of salt in there and taste it, oh, it's a little salty. If you dump a bunch of salt in there and taste it, it's like, whoa, that's super, super salty. So strong acids are just acids with a lot of, of hydrogen ions or protons floating around in solution. The more we have, then the stronger it is. And the pH scale is set up to calculate the concentration of those hydrogen ions. It involves the logarithm of the concentration of the hydrogen ions, and it's set up in such a way so that the stronger acid has lower, lower numbers. But it's a logarithmic scale because the calculation of pH involves the function that we call a logarithm in math. Now, of course, there are other acids, right? That simple one, hydrochloric acid, is one hydrogen, H, and one chlorine, Cl, so it's HCl. But there are other acids. Another one you may have heard of is called sulfuric acid. That one is H2SO4. The, there's a sulfur in there, and so it's called sulfuric acid, right? But notice that it's H2SO4. That means there's two atoms of hydrogen bonded to the rest of the molecule there. So when you dissolve it in water, um, one of the atoms of hydrogen, or the ions, comes off immediately into solution, donates a lot of hydrogen because there's two of them bonded to every bit of the, of the sulfate at the end there. There's an additional hydrogen left behind, which can also ionize in solution to different degrees, depending on, on, on how exactly it's done. But anyway, the concept I'm trying to get to here is that all of these acids have hydrogen in there. HCl has hydrogen, sulfuric acid has hydrogen. Other acids have hydrogen, they're proton donors, okay? All right, so we've established that a strong acid has lots of hydrogen ions, AKA lots of protons, literally dissolved in solution. Why does that make an acid corrosive? Why does it make it like an alien that can eat through decking or whatever, like dissolve things, you know, and, and just eat things up like that? Why does it work well in our stomach? All right, so we need to talk a little bit about science and physics here, okay? The hydrogen ion is simply a proton. There are no electrons around it. It is a naked proton. There's nothing else there. And so there's only four fundamental forces of nature. Gravity, which is super weak, millions of times weaker than everything else. And then you have the strong nuclear force inside the nucleus, and you have the weak nuclear force inside the nucleus, and then you have the electromagnetic force. That governs like charges repelling and attracting, and it governs 
it governs waves, photons, and all kinds of other things. But that force of electromagnetism, that attraction of opposite charges or the repulsion of like charges is millions and millions of times stronger than gravity. It's really, really, really strong. And so when you have an acid, you have a, a solution, literally a water solution with tons of protons, naked protons floating around with no electrons around them. And that proton is positively charged. And that proton is hungry for an electron. It's gonna attract any electron from anywhere it can. Right? So if I have a very strong acid and I put a metal inside of there because acids often react with metals very violently, okay? If I drop zinc into the acid, let's say, or some other metal like this, those metals have lots of electrons in their outer shells and they're very uh, often uh, very loosely bound electrons. That's why metals conduct electricity so well because the electrons in the outer shell are just not, they're not being held onto very tightly. So those electrons out there are ripe pickings and that proton is gonna attract and it's gonna rip off any electron that it can feel from a nearby force. If a zinc atom comes into proximity with that proton, that proton is gonna rip off one of those electrons because there's nothing shielding that proton and that electric attractive force is very, very strong. And even if you don't put a metal in, if you put your finger in there, your finger is full of atoms with electrons, uh, electron clouds floating around and it is going to try to attract any electrons that it can back in and make it a neutral hydrogen atom again. And so that is why acids are so corrosive because it's a naked proton floating around in there. And so the more of those protons you have floating around in the solution, then the more violent and corrosive it's going to be because it's gonna be attracting anything you put in there, it's gonna to try to react. Of course, some things it can react more readily with others, usually metals because the electrons are so easy to get to. Other things may be a little bit harder, but acids will in general affect most substances that you put into one degree or another. So when we eat food, that's the first line of breaking it down. Our hydrochloric acid in there is breaking things down and it passes into your gut and does all the things that your bodies do. That is why acids corrode things. When we say acids cause burns, we're not talking about holding a flame and burning it from heat like that. We're talking about a chemical burn. And a chemical burn is basically that your skin or whatever has, has partially reacted with something and electrons have been uh, changed and moved around. So it behaves in a burn sort of because it's like a violent rearrangement of, of your atoms and electrons, but it's not due to heat or a flame. It's due to a chemical reaction with an acid. So even though the phosphoric acid in soda is really is an acid and can hurt you theoretically, the concentration is quite low. And once you drink it, it gets diluted even further by the contents of your stomach. The body is evolved to handle a variety of foods and beverages, including acidic ones, without sustaining damage. Now, some people might argue that drinking too much Coke or soda in general can cause other issues, and they're not entirely wrong. Coca-Cola contains caffeine. It can stimulate the stomach to produce more acid. For most people, this isn't a problem. But for some people that have conditions like acid reflux or ulcers, it can exacerbate and make worse the symptoms. Additionally, people with a bacterial infection can experience increased acidity and associated discomfort. This bacteria can cause ulcers and the extra acid production stimulated by caffeine could potentially worsen the situation. So while Coke isn't burning a hole in anybody's stomach, it can contribute to discomfort in those with pre-existing conditions. So where does this myth actually come from? It's probably due to the dramatic stories that highlight the acidic nature of Coke. For instance, the tales of Coke dissolving teeth overnight if left in a glass of the drink are exaggerated, but not entirely baseless. The acids in Coke can actually erode the enamel of your teeth over time, especially with prolonged exposure. But your stomach is not made of teeth enamel anyway, and it's equipped with protective mechanisms to protect against much stronger acids. So to wrap it all up, while Coca-Cola is actually acidic and it contains ingredients that could cause discomfort in lots of situations, it's not potent enough to burn a hole in your stomach. Your stomach is actually one tough cookie designed to handle much stronger acids on a daily basis. So while it's always good to consume sugary acidic drinks in moderation, we all should really do that, you can sip your Coke without fear of it turning your stomach into Swiss cheese, for lack of a better word. I'd like to really thank you for hanging out with me today. I hope that you found this exploration of Coca-Cola, acids, and your stomach actually fascinating and informative. Sometimes simple questions like this have not so simple answers, but we need to keep 
asking the questions and learning each and every day. Remember, science is all about curiosity and questioning what we think we know. And until next time, keep wondering and please always stay curious. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.